Islam has a doctrine of lying. So it has a very clear doctrine of how to lie, when to lie, who to lie to. So the Muslims were very much tied up with the Nazis. There were eight Muslim SS units in the Balkans in the Soviet Union. Now the largest Nazi SS unit was the Muslim unit. The highest reward for a lay Muslim is given when you die in jihad. Now, this is not ISIS Islam, this is, this is your neighbor's Islam. The question is, is he following it today? Well, good. If he isn't, but maybe tomorrow, you never know. Motivated and underrated, I feel elated when I touch the stage, everybody going crazy. I'm hip to the game, so don't you try to play me. Welcome to Yoel's Hangouts podcast. I'm your host, Yoel. We got a very special guest here today. His name is Lloyd D. Young. Is that, am I saying your last name properly? What's the origin of your last name? Um, my father's family settled in South Africa from Holland, and we've got records in the archives going back to about 1693. So it's De Jong. Wow. So De Jong. Dutch. Okay. Wow, that's cool. Um, but yeah, guys, so this guy is someone that, you know, I stumbled upon uh, going into uh, Sam. Sam, I, I don't know. How, how do you say his last name? Moon. Sh 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 Shamoon. Shamoon. Sam Shamoon. He's, um, you know, as some of you guys know, I'm a Christian, so he does a lot of apologetics. He educates a lot of people and he featured Lloyd on his channel. Um, I stumbled upon him. I thought his like perspective and the information was one really accurate, but also really interesting and things that a lot of people don't talk about um, as far as the history of Islam, um, even, you know, Palestine, Israel, like biblical stuff, different denominations, Martin Luther. And I just, you know, I reached out and he was, you know, humble enough and cool enough to come on the show. Um, Lloyd, we appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. No, thank you. I appreciate the invitation. Of course, man. So how did you get into deep dives, I guess, is is kind of your, why I stumbled upon your stuff. Like, how did you get into that? Why are you so good at that? That's a, I've, I've always had an obsession with detail, I think. And my previous profession, when I lived and worked in the Middle East, I had to do analysis of of environments and situations to decide on what's the best way to design, let's say, a security system or to what's the best way to prevent an attack before it happened. So I was involved in the design of security systems and surveillance systems to predict and prevent attacks, so early warning systems. So the aim was not to react after the fact, but design something before. So you had to really think through the mind of the person that would attack a, a site. And so you had to work through the scenarios, work through. And one of the important things when you're looking at how a crime is going to be committed is how are they going to deceive you? How are they going to mislead you? So that means that you run through this process of analysis and you start to find little details that don't match. You start to find it's like being a, a detective in a way. And I think this I, I bring some of this into what I'm doing. And what sparked me was I was doing a, a counterterrorism course. Um, online through a university in Holland, Leiden University. And what was odd is that the rector, or the dean of the department, refused to accept, no matter what evidence was presented, that the Muslim Brotherhood was anything other than benign. And I'm assuming that they were funding his department. Mm. So I was eventually banned from the group. I wasn't allowed to, to comment or speak or do anything, simply because I, after the fall of Raqqa, I presented material which was taken from the, the Islamic training of these terrorists. And this was standard Orthodox Islam. And I started speaking about the Sharia, the Sharia manuals. Often you hear about, we want Sharia for Britain, we want Sharia for, the, for America. We want Sharia courts. And what is this famous Sharia? No one seems to really know. So I studied it in depth. I looked through the sources and I found that the, the, the terrorist Sunni sources were the standard sources that were being taught at Islamic universities like Al-Ashar and at Medina in, in Saudi Arabia. And roughly, not, let's say, very, very short order when I started posting these things and discussing them on the counterterrorism forum, I was banned. Now, we were able to talk about Christian terrorism, Buddhist terrorism, came to Islamic terrorism, they shut me down and kicked my ass out so fast. And this was like, this was my, my this compelled me to start to talk about these issues because I was annoyed. 
Yeah, wow. So Sharia, I mean, you're saying it properly, but I think maybe people are probably going to like Sharia is like how we hear about it in the news in America. Um, so it, so in Iran, and again, I'm not as smart as you by any means, but in Iran, would you say that, you know, people talk about, oh, like Sharia law, they're extremists in Iran. Are they being extreme the way they, I guess? No, they're extreme. just being they, orthodox. Okay. There's, I have to provide a few terms, a couple of terms and definitions, and I'll simplify it. Within Islam, there's a range of acceptable behaviors. For each of these limits of behavior, you get recognition and you get reward from Allah because both are following the will of Allah. So on the one end, you have what, the, what we call extreme, which is azima, which is strictness. You are simply following the law of Allah and Muhammad, the Sharia, strictly. Then you have ruhsa on the other end, which is dispensation, a loosening, a relaxation of the law. So Muslims that are just being moderate are simply following the doctrine of ruhsa, and they are earning reward for that. Now, what people don't realize is that Islam isn't based on the concept that we have in the West of logos. It's a, it's a completely different way of thinking. It's a different mindset. So, for instance, the difference between ruhsa and azima can be complete opposites. So you could literally violate the law of Islam and still be following Islam because you're following the law of ruhsa. So you are following dispensation. Now, of course, the one who follows strictly is getting more credit, more reward from Allah. And of course, according to Sharia law, a certain limited number of Muslims must have to follow Islam strictly or all Muslims will fall into sin and corruption and be cast into hell. Allah will turn his back on them. So the extremists must exist or Islam becomes apostate. Hopefully that makes sense. There's more doctrine I can add to that, but these are all covered in my channel. Well, there's one more thing I can add, and I'll be very blunt. Um, Islam has a doctrine of lying. So it has a very clear doctrine of how to lie, when to lie, who to lie to. So it has a very distinct doctrine of lying, multiple different kinds of lying. And unfortunately within this, lying is legal in Islam. In fact, it is obligatory. It is compulsory. So compounding the fact of having this, 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 this doctrine of azima and ruhsa, you've also got the fact that if something will embarrass Islam, you must lie because you may not embarrass Islam. So therefore, you don't know if someone's telling the truth. So, so this adds to, just complicates the matter further. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And that doesn't mean all people that are Muslim are, you know, lying or anything like that. I mean, I think my audience is relatively, and I think we can be adults here and not do these like, well, not everybody, you know, thank God we don't have like a live chat or anything. I'd post this after. So we don't get distracted. Um, yeah. So I was talking to this girl, she's from uh, Jordan and um, you know, there's a lot of Palestinians in Jordan and they had a perspective on, you know, the history of, of Israel and how it was founded. And, you know, they all had the same story. They all had this, uh, you know, the bad, Jews came here, they did this, and it was an atrocity. And I'm sure there were some bad things. And then she said, well, I don't know why they would lie. Like, why would they lie? Why would they all lie? Like, I don't think that, you know, there's certain propaganda, there's certain things that I study in school, but I don't know why they would lie. And I was like, well, if you want to get like an unbiased perspective, why don't you talk to also, you know, maybe people that were here on the Israel, on Israel side, to have a conversation and see what their perspective is. She's like, well, I, I just, I don't know why they would lie. Like, why would they lie? And, um, you know, I have heard that before that in Islam, de dependent on the circumstance. And if it's like questioning their, their, you know, ethos or, or Allah, they're allowed to lie. And, and I know that, um, there's certain in instances, like for example, um, cause for, for me, you know, I grew up relatively Christian, also with the Jewish kind of brush on my, uh, on my mom's side. Um, so the concept of like religious endorsed lying is something that's like so counterintuitive to intuitive to religion and God in general. It's counterintuitive to Western religion, to Christianity. So, uh, another thing is that you must realize the word Dawa. So Muslims practice Dawa. And when you go through the Islamic sources, you'll find that dawa is the equivalent of propaganda. Propaganda is political rhetoric, not necessarily 
associated with the truth. So Dawah is propaganda. So understand that this is propaganda and it is legal and obligatory, compulsory to lie. So now this is something that you'd have to go through the Islamic uh, Sharia sources. You'd have to go to the highest rank of scholars, the most historically sound, valid and trusted scholars. You'd have to go to the sources that when you become an Imam or a Qadi or a Sheikh, these are the, these are the books that they study to qualify. You know what's funny? Know that, that, yeah. I was just gonna just I'll let you finish your point, but it, you know what? It reminds me of when I was watching these videos about Scientology, and um, this one lady that just came out of Scientology, she was like, "Yeah, well, you know, once you reach this next level, they give you more information, and then you reach this next level, and they tell you, um, you know, really what it means to." be this next level of you know scientology or whatever and i'm like dang that sounds very familiar it sounds like you know a fraternity it sounds like you know a secret society it's like there's always like the thing you need to do to get to that next level to get more information and then they try to see if you qualify for the additional information it's like this is like cult 101 in my opinion okay i'm glad you raised that let me look up a source. So then you talked about different levels. Um, let me just find something for you on that. Now, I have a much lengthier presentation on Islamic law called the Muslim Talmud. And I deliberately call it the Muslim Talmud because it is, Islam is borrowed from, a, from numerous different religious traditions and sources. So it has taken from Babylonian paganism. It has taken from Gnosticism, it has taken from Christianity, it has taken from Judaism. And when they wanted to create their own identity, they needed to, they were competing with Judaism, that they were the new Jews, they were the new Christians. And therefore they took the Talmud and they modified it to suit their purposes. You spoke of levels in Islam. So Islam has two divisions and four levels. So the divisions are legislative and spiritual. Now, few people realize, and again, I will say very bluntly, and these things are covered in my, in my videos where I go in depth through the Islamic sources that are learned by these scholars in university. And if you don't like that, you need to ask the Islamic scholars and the Islamic universities why they teach these things. But the spiritual aspect of Islam is Gnostic. Islam claims explicitly in the Sharia, not ambiguously, explicitly to be a Gnostic religion. It is Gnostic. So you've got the legislative and you have the spiritual. Now, the spiritual aspect or the Gnostic aspect of Islam is restricted to an elite. They call them the elect, just like they do in Calvinism, the elect. And then, of course, the legislative is where you've got your lower level scholars who have to administer the law of Allah because Islam is not a religion according to its own definition. According to Islam's own definition, it is a legal system like, like uh, socialism. Like where, where is that? It, where's that in? Is that in the Quran? Is that in the Hadiths? Like where, where? So the, the Quran is something you, you need to look beyond the Quran. The Quran is a very small book, has very little detail. It must be supported by other texts, right? The Quran has been exegeted and it's been it's been expanded and explained within the Sharia. The Sharia is the is the the Sharia supersedes the Quran. It explains and clarifies and provides the consensus. What they call the ijma. So as I said, you've got so the Sharia means the obeying of Allah, how to obey Allah. It is the outer exoteric. So it's the outer practice of Islam. On the opposite side, the hakika is the knowing of Allah, the secret knowledge. It is the inner esoteric subjective sense of Allah, the direct personal connection with Allah through using rituals to gain, to gain entrance into Allah's throne room and so on and so on and so on. So it's the gnosis of Allah. Then you've got four levels at the very lowest level you have what's called the Ibara, literal, or the Zahir, which scholars call Islam for the masses. So this is the Islam that is the practice of the legislative subjects, your average Muslim. Then at a slightly higher level, you have the Ishara, implied allusion, so for the legislative practitioners. Then you have the Lataif, the nuances or subtleties. That's for your highest level or higher level of spiritual practitioners. And then your highest levels of Muslims, they follow the Haqqaiq which is reality, truth, divine essence, but this is beyond truth. It is, so this is for your advanced spiritual practitioners, your top level, your, your elite within the Muslim hierarchy. But also the haqqaiq is, man, to, to simplify it, uh, and hopefully not to oversimplify it, but Muhammad is what the universe is made of. 
Allah made Muhammad out of himself. Muhammad is made from the same substance as Allah, and the universe was made for Muhammad. The earth was made for Muhammad, but also from Muhammad. The earth is made from Muhammad. Everyone is made from Muhammad. The prophets are made from Muhammad. The light of the prophets, the light of Abraham, David, the light of Jesus, these are all just fractions, little pieces taken from Muhammad's light so that they represent a sample of Muhammad's light. And I, this I is thought, how I this, thought I thought Muhammad was just a man. Like I, I didn't know he had like any sort of like divinity or like superpowers or, you know. <laughs> you need to read what is known as the um, the Sira. These are the effectively the Gospels of Muhammad. They're often called the biographies. Got so it. when you read the Sira of Muhammad, and these things win prizes. I mean, these, give me one sec. These books win prizes, and these describe to you the miraculous nature of Muhammad. Muhammad as a god, Muhammad as a deity. In fact, when you read the Sira, Muhammad is the real Jesus. Hmm. Muhammad is hmm. literally made from the same essence as Allah. So therefore, Muhammad effectively is the partner of Allah. Now, you said the Shur the Sharia, uh, the Sharia law, is that something that people have? Like how, like the the, the average uh, Muslim, do they have access to that, or like how do how closely do they follow it, or what's the relationship like an average Muslim has? It's to illegal it? for Muslims to speak about the Sharia. It's not legal for them to talk about it. It's it's considered treason for you to reveal, because the Sharia is effectively the operational plan. It's the doctrine. The truth Got of the it. doctrine, the consensus, the ijma, where, where all of the different groups converge, and they're not allowed to reveal this to you because you are not you are not an initiate. But also, certain levels of it, as we saw within the levels, you are not at the higher level, so therefore, you know you have less knowledge, and as you proceed up the levels, you get more knowledge, and um, so they cannot reveal the Sharia to you. But once you look at the Sharia and you look at the actual laws, like how do they exegete? How do the Muslim scholars, how do they traditionally exegete these verses in the Quran? For instance, you might have one verse in the Quran. Like if you look at the chopping off of hands, I mean, there's one or two verses in the Quran that speak about that. But if you go into just one Sharia manual, there'll be like 55 pages discussing it. So then they've mm -hmm. taken that and they've exegeted it. They've, they've explained it in every possible permutation and provided general rules and provided specific rules. So they've taken one or two verses in the Quran and they've written like 55 pages of detailed explanation of how and when and who gets their hands chopped off and what are the... Kind of like the, the Talmud um, a little bit? Sorry? Kind of like the Talmud, like how it's like they take these certain things, they expand on it in the Talmud kind yep. of, but like their own version of it, I guess. Um, yeah, but very different. Okay. The two are not the same. I know I called the, the on my show, I call it the Muslim Talmud, but this is not to say it's a one-to-one it's a -one correlation to the Talmud. That, that it is yeah, not. no, 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 definitely not. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, but this is a uh, genuine set of laws. It's a legal system. And the thing is, when they take over the country, they are going to replace the Western legal system with the Sharia. Now, this doesn't mean they can't do this over time, piecemeal, 1% by 1% at a time. It doesn't mean they have to do it all at once. And don't forget that this is a, there's a, there's like a, a curve they're on. So over time, eventually, they need to be 100% Sharia compliant, but not today. They start at 1%, then 2%, then 3%, and so on. It builds. Yeah, Remember that wow. Azimat Ruhsa, strictness and leniency. Wow. Okay. Um, well, I guess let's localize it a little bit um, because I don't think, I mean, my audience, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't, I think they probably know as much as me about, about this stuff, which is not a ton, um, but uh -huh. I'm kind of starting to learn a little bit more. Um, so localizing it, I'm in Israel right now. Um, let's kind of have a conversation as far as what the history of, um, Palestine, I guess, is or from what you've researched. I mean, anybody else can can throw their hat in the ring and 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 have these conversations and do do their research. But you you've made an interesting link. I don't want to kind of give it away, um, but it's something that I think people that live here would be really interested in in, in kind of hearing the the history of things because a lot of our textbooks um, they are kind of politically correct and don't cover certain things that are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what again? What exactly should you want me to to clarify? Um, so the link, I would say, the link between uh, Palestine and kind of the 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 start of it, and then also the, um, I guess, the relationship that 
um, I forget what his name was, but the 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 from the Soviet Union and and even Hitler's connection oh, to. Oh, uh, you're referring to one of the previous talks that I gave on this. Um, yeah, I did a detailed. I did a couple of detailed talks. There's one talk on my channel called um, the the Palestinian occupation of Israel. And, yeah, super um, interesting. That, yeah, that would be useful because I. The thing is, I can't remember all the facts all the time. So I have these references. I mean, this is one very long, just a list of things, but then I, I convert these into presentations. Um, but very briefly then. Um, yeah, definitely go on his channel, guys. Like if you want to go, like I kind of want to make this episode kind of like a, a snapshots of different things that you cover because, you know, we're not going to get it all covered in the, in the short time, but I want to just kind of show people the 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 depth of the yeah. things that you cover. Yeah. So, so there are direct links between the Palestinians, as they are called, and the Nazis. So here you've got Hajj Amin al husseini who was a guest of Adolf Hitler in Berlin for some years, some time. And of course, he volunteered to become a member of the SS and he was made a general. So he raised troops and he fought for the Nazis. He was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem back in the day. And of course, so something like 660,000 Muslims fought on the side of the Nazis, which few people realize. Wow. Few people realize that, that nearly 700,000 Muslims apparently fought on the side of the Nazis. Uh, let me actually just go here, for instance. Uh, how many, how many, just, and as you're doing that, like I'm just trying to think like, I always try to think of when I get new information or information that, might surprise me or you know may, may may make me feel uncomfortable i'm like how how many of these particular group of people how many of them actually know this history like is it something Very that they few. know it's not, not spoken about openly because okay a couple of things in islam muslims are not allowed to speak ill of islam this is blasphemy right this is blasphemy but also it's it's illegal it goes against the sharia and Again, I speak about this at length in my, my shows and I go through the Sharia rulings. I show the laws from the books. I'm always showing the, the rulings on the screen and I provide the books for people to download and read for themselves. So I always make the resources available for everyone to go read it for themselves. But um, so here you've got all of these troops. This is a German article, right? Uh, that says Hitler had a lot of love for Islam, but you're not allowed to slander Islam. Now to slander Islam, now, in the West, to slander is to tell a lie, to smear someone unfairly. Whereas the definition of slander, ghibba, in Islam is very different. Slander in Islam legally is to tell something that is true, but is embarrassing to that person. That is slander. Mm -hmm. So to mm -hmm. tell the truth in Islam that someone would not want revealed, that is considered slander. So this is known as ghibba. And, uh, and this is an issue within Islam. So in other words, and also the Sharia is also binding upon you as a non-Muslim. So it's not just binding upon Muslims, it's binding upon non-Muslims and they must make it binding upon you. So, ah, I just hit the wrong button. So let me just, uh, me it's just, all good. Um, yeah, no, that's, a. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause there isn't really anything like I can speak for, I mean, I grew up in a, in a Christian and Jewish kind of household. There isn't really anything that, um, is like that from what I know, from what I've read. Um, for some reason that's. So it's like, I've just never heard of anything like that. It's very interesting. And it kind of makes sense. Like you can see kind of a little bit of PR going on, um, especially when it comes to the conflict. Um, there's a lot of like, hey, this is what's happening when in reality, you know, it might not be the case, but oh. kind of lying is like oh, a slippery slope. slope. Sorry. Yeah. So just there to just to verify what I was saying. So, for instance, here's a different context, but the rule applies generally. So if he notices something, if he notices something good, it is sunnah to mention it. But if he notices something bad, it is unlawful to mention it because this is slander. See, there's a very different definition of slander. So let me close this. Now, slander and the meaning of slander. So this is in the Reliance of the Traveler. This is the most popular Islamic law manual in the world. And this was also being used by ISIS and so on. And when I put this book into the forum and I started discussing Islamic law, and this being one of the primary manuals taught to the ISIS troops by the ISIS imams, that's when I got banned. So, so slander, 
See here? Slander, ghibba, means to mention anything concerning a person that he would dislike. Not to lie about him, not to mention an untruth. See, that's a very different legal definition. So to say something about Islam. So the Muslims were very much tied up with the Nazis, right? For instance, the SS, the Nazi SS, which was the private army that belonged to, to Hitler, there were eight Muslim SS units in the Balkans in the Soviet Union. Now, the largest Nazi SS unit was the Muslim unit. Wow. Called the Hanshar, right? Um, now, this, for instance, was a <laughs> hard to deny Holocaust your father saved the Jews from, because here you've got Muslims who actually saved some Jews, and they're considered as righteous among the Gentiles. So that's very, very interesting, right? Then, for instance, um, Palestinians gave Jews safe haven, but that's a discussion from the time. Okay, there's discussions about they know that the Mufti led lots of troops and how the Nazis obviously caught the Islamic world during World War II. So there's, there's plenty of evidence if you want to look at it and go through it. I mean, you can see here Heil Hitler from this good old Muslim here hanging out with the heads of the SS, the heads of the German Air Force, Goering, Himmler, and so on. And who is so, this guy with the hat? This with dude the, here? Uh, white, yeah. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajj Amin al Husseini. Wow. Okay. Uh, this is Heinrich Himmler, SS commander. <laughs> Warm wishes to Mufti Hajj Amin al Husseini. So wow. here he is with these Nazi troops, checking out the troops. And Islam und Judentum, Islam and the Jews, or, you know, Islam and wow. the Jewry. So this is, these are Muslims with their little death's head icons. These are Ottomans. So Muslims. So you can see that they were very much bound up uh, with the uh, Islam, the Nazi Germany war. So, yeah, and this is all based on, on Islamic doctrine. Because yeah, I was going to say, because the uh, I, I was watching something. It was the, uh, I couldn't believe this person said this out loud. Um, it was, you know, Pat, the Patrick Bid David uh, podcast? Yeah. You know, you've seen yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. Did you see the recent debate between kind of like, I guess, like two Muslims and then uh, two people that had kind of wrote books? Um, the discussing Daniel like Pikachu the and someone and someone else. Yeah, I, I, I've yeah. watched like a couple of minutes of it at most. I, it was it was, hard, I mean, it was a little hard was... to watch in the beginning. I'm not going to lie. It was like it was very yeah. hard to watch. But um, but what was interesting about it, I, I had to watch it because this one guy, he was from um, Morocco and he was Muslim and then he converted to Christianity but then ended up um, leaving because, you know, he, he ended up trying to leave because he was being threatened to be killed essentially. And, um, you know, one might say, okay, well that's extreme. You know, it's a barbaric, you know, third world country, you know, it's just, you know, violence happens. It's just probably war torn. You know, there's a bunch of excuses that happen when people say, oh, he was killed because of this. But, um, on, on that very show, um, one of the Muslims that was there, he was like, Hey, um, so, you know, part of, being in Sharia law, it says to kill, uh, to kill people that convert out of Islam. And he was like, and he was like, well, do you think that that, do you think you'd be a good Muslim if you killed me? And then he was like, yeah, I mean, if I'm following the, you know, if, for me to be a good Muslim, I have to kill you. And he was like, wait, so you're saying right now that you should under proper Islam, you should kill me right now because I left Islam. And when, yes, he's like, yes, that's true. Look, let's have a look here. For instance, this is this is Sharia, right? Now, this is ISIS did these things because they were following Islam strictly, Azima, right? Let's have a look. A Muslim holds the prayer to be obligatory, but through lack of concern, neglects to perform it, has not committed unbelief. Thank heavens, rather he is executed, washed, prayed over, and buried in the Muslim cemetery. This is strict Whoa. Islam. If you forget the prayer. You are killed. This is what ISIS did with their people. If they forgot to do the prayers, they neglected, they were killed. So ISIS is not an abomination. ISIS is practicing Islam strictly. So let me continue here. They're labeled as extremists, but maybe extremists relative to, not to Islam, apparently. Um, yeah. Okay, hold on. Let me just go back one. And for those listening right now, he's pulling up um, archives. Yeah. So it's, this isn't just his opinion. He's not. And he, you guys have the right to look up his sources. So, Please yeah. follow his These channel. are the laws. This is the Reliance of the Traveler. So if you go to any one of my videos in the description box, there's a link to the Reliance of the Traveler. It is the most common, the most popular, most readily available Islamic law manual in English in the world. It contains 
rulings from all four schools of fiqh, the recognized four schools of fiqh, it shows what is the ijma, which is the, con the consistency across all four schools, which is about 80% the same. The 20% that where they differ, this is just cosmetic stuff. Like, do you hold your hands here when you pray? Do you hold it by your belly? That's, that's, that doesn't matter. Those are cosmetic issues. Now, for instance, killing an apostate from Islam is without consequences. And it shows us here a father or mother or their fathers or mothers or their grandparents for killing their offspring or offspring's offspring. So there is no consequence according to the Islamic law for killing your own children. That's so, so that, and there is no indemnity for killing an apostate since it is killing someone who deserves to die. Did I read that wrong, Joel? Whoa, no. Were you you no, Did I read that? Wow. Jeez. This is proper. This is Islam. normal Islam. Standard, regular, common or garden variety Islam. This is not ISIS Islam. This is this is your neighbor's Islam. The question is, is he following it today? Well, good. If he isn't, but maybe tomorrow. You never know. That's the problem. Yeah, this tough. is the law. This is the law of Allah. So whether he's practicing it, that's that, that, that can be debated. But this is the law of Allah. Wow. And what's tough is even if you have a conversation with somebody like this, it's in their doctrine to lie, to be, they have permission yes. at least to lie, not saying they all lie and, you know, you can't listen to them or trust them, but yeah. they have religiously, you know, sanctioned, I guess, lie. Yeah. Well, when a person, law 8.1, section O, which is justice, 8.1, when a person who has reached puberty and is sane, voluntarily apostatizes from Islam, he deserves to be killed. And it says here, under Sunni, Jurisprudence, juris, juris sorry, ask him to repent. If he refuses, he is immediately killed. Now, understand that this now different schools will differ. For instance, the one school will say, give them three days. The other school will say, do it on the spot. Another one will say, give them 24 hours. That is where the, the differences between the schools come in. They all say that you die. The one says, burn him. The other one says, drown him. The other one says, choke him to death. The other one says, chop off his head. The other one says, starve him to death. The fact is that at the end of the day, you you know what the punishment is. You understand? Yeah. Wow. Wow. So that's a uh, that's tough. So what would you say? I mean, let's kind of I guess localize it a little bit. I don't know how much you've. I mean, it seems I feel like you have studied the Israel Palestine uh, conflict. I mean, I'm in Israel right now. I think it'd be obviously kind of interesting. Um, in their doctrine, if I mean, we can talk about the political uh, backdrops or the the religious backdrops, but it seems like they come in and and if 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 someone from from the the Palestinian territories they come in and they kill an innocent person, it doesn't matter if they're young, old, woman, man, it doesn't matter. Um, and they they know they're going to die. I don't think anybody that commits you know any sort of terrorist attack in Israel doesn't know they're going to die. They they know they're going to die, and then back home, um, you know they're martyrs. They're celebrated. People hand out candies. Um, what what I guess would you say from a religious perspective? Is there anything from because they're not all Muslims, but I mean I would say like a lot, like maybe in the ninety nine percent. Um, they're, they're, they're Muslims. So is there anything that co-signs that? Is that just like a, um, like what, where do you think that may come from or you mean, I don't know. why the aggression? Like Say it again? why the aggression? And because they earn yeah. reward for, for killing and being killed in the name of Allah, they earn reward for that. So, so let me, let me briefly touch on this. Okay. So this section is commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Now, you as a Christian, you know there's the Great Commission. Go out unto all men and preach the gospel, right? Converting all men in the name of Jesus Christ, right? That's the Great Commission from a Christian perspective. Islam also has a Great Commission. It is called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Commanding the right is to enforce the right, which is the will of Allah. The will of Allah is found in the Sharia. That is the right. The wrong is whatever you happen to believe. Are you a Muslim? Then you're wrong. They're easy peasy to make that decision. All right. So Muslims have an obligation to command the right. It's a communal obligation. In other words, it's binding upon everybody, right? There are levels of censure. There are levels of severity. So for instance, 
you have to know what is wrong and what is right. So Muslims must have some concept of what is right and wrong according to the Sharia. Now you must understand Islam doesn't have a sense of morality. We have under Christian doctrine a sense of morals, right and wrong as a sense, right? Based on, based on God's law, moral law. Islam doesn't have morality. It has legal and illegal. It has haram and halal. Islam doesn't have morality. It has right and wrong. These are legal concepts. These are defined in the Sharia, described in the Sharia. But also because it's a legal concept based on a legal system, there are loopholes in the law where you can violate and bypass the law. They are extenuating circumstances which allow you to completely toss the law out and do something else which is legal. So there are legal loopholes and there are exceptions. You must understand this. Now, Muslims must act according to a scale, and this is the scale here. So they must have knowledge of the wrong act. So Muslims must have some knowledge of the Sharia, whether they learn it from their parents or in the mosque or whatever, but it's, it's part of the cultural heritage. Now, they must be able to explain that something is wrong. Then they must forbid the act verbally. Then a Muslim has to censure you with harsh words. Now, when they use harsh words, they mean foul language, to swear at you, to insult your mother, to belittle you, humiliate you, undermine you, speak in a very, very dirty manner to you. Okay, that's mm -hmm. harsh words. Then they must write the wrong by hand. I don't mean pick up a pen and write the word wrong. I mean, write the wrong by hand. Okay. I mean, so I, hopefully people sort of get the idea what I mean here. You must write the wrong by hand. He's right? holding up fists for those listening. <laughs> right. And then intimidation. Notice as, remember, this is the perfect religion. Then says your next step is intimidation, assault, and force of arms. These are religious rulings in the Sharia. Intimidation, assault, force of arms. Would you consider that Christian? Yeah, I was or just going to say, that. like, this is, it would be like, this is like so, like, this doesn't even seem like in the same category of being a religion from, from what I've. You understand? I mean, this is yeah, so, that's crazy. So it says here, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong is the most important fundamental of the religion. This is the mission that Allah sent the prophets to fulfill. And that includes the, uh, the, the Muslim prophets like Abraham, David, you know, all of those Muslim prophets, Jesus. And so if this were not done, religion itself, Islam, would vanish. So this is the obligation, okay? And it wow. states here that let there be a group of you who call to good, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. For those are the successful. So that is important. That's Quran 3, 104. And these are the people who are acting on the concept of azima, right? So let me just run. I'm not going to do all of this. Whoever of you sees something is wrong, let him change it with his hand. If you can't change it with your hand, then change it with your tongue. And if you can't with your heart, but that is the weakest degree of faith. So if you Jeez. can't <clears throat> change it with your hand, then uh, you're not a great Muslim, are you? Now, there's a lot to be said here. Again, I cover this in depth on my channel. Okay, and they discuss this. So let me see here. I want to go to the sections where they talk about what may be censured, but I want to talk about the use of force. Um, yeah, guys, this is like you. You guys need to go to if you're if you're someone like me that loves information, that loves like just history, deep dives. Like you guys need to follow his channel yeah. for sure. So you mentioned now why do they do this and what makes them carry out these violent deeds and what makes them stop. So let's look at intimidation. Q. 5.7. The sixth degree is threatening and intimidation by saying, stop this or I will. And when possible, this should, this should precede actually hitting the person. Wow. So remember, do you remember in James, James chapter three, verse, no, no, sorry, hold on, hang on, hang on. I just, I just got it wrong. Uh, we have to look in the most violent book in the Bible, the book of Acts, which teaches that, that which, which James says, um, when someone doesn't obey, pick up your axe and beat them, right? Am I getting this? No, no. Actually, I, hold I on. No, that book, that one. I don't remember that one either. But in Islam, yeah, they weird. teach you, when possible, you should threaten them before actually hitting them. So here you've got Islam teaching and its religious law, the perfect, remember the absolutely perfect law of Allah, which Muslims will refuse to discuss with you. They will absolutely in four years, I have asked Muslims on my channel, every single Muslim who comments on my channel, I say, please 
Let's meet. Let's talk. Let's open these books. Let's read them publicly. Give me your input. I will read these verses, uh, these, sorry, these passages from the Sharia, from the greatest scholars in Islam to ever live. And just let's talk about this. And they refuse because they are not allowed to, because it will embarrass Islam. So now notice the rule for this level is not to make a threat that you cannot carry out. So wow. you only, okay. And then you move to assault. The seventh degree is to directly hit or kick the person or similar measures that do not involve weapons. And this is permissible for private individuals. That's fantastic. The eighth degree is when one is unable to essentially act by oneself and requires the armed assistance of others. And Muslims say, but you need, you see, that's an act of war and you have to go to the caliph and there's no caliphs. Well, it says here, there is no need for the caliph's permission. So do you wow. think that this is what we would call godly? The religion of peace or the religion of we will get a gang and shoot you to death. Yeah, that's 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 tough. I, I would say I mean that's that's tough to refute. Um I've seen I've heard people say like like even if we're taking one instance, because I don't know why this came to mind, like, oh well, if you do something, if you perform something that's jihad or something that is for religious um purposes then you get all these virgins in heaven is that like a thing or is that like some sort of yeah, I mean, of course you get reward in heaven but few people realize so according to the standard sources that we are given by muslims the the highest reward for a lay muslim is given when you die in jihad when you are involved in violent jihad for the sake of allah and you are killed Right? And if you kill and not killed, you will earn a place in heaven that's a hundred levels greater than the Muslim who just died in his bed. But few people realize that that doesn't stop there. It actually, there are greater levels even than that. So there's discussion within, again, it's on my channel. If you look at the, if you look at my, my videos discussing like the doctrine of lying in Islam and the doctrine of jihad or demis and jizya, how that works, <laughs> there are higher levels. Like for instance, a Muslim who lies to non-Muslims to keep the peace is also doing jihad. He he defends Islam through his lies and through through maintaining an animosity towards non-Muslims while not revealing it. That also earns him the equivalent of jihad and sometimes greater. And then scholars have an even greater level of of reward, which is even higher than those who die in jihad, because they are the ones who practice the gnosis. And those who practice the gnosis have the absolute highest level they nearly they, they can reach up to the same level as Muhammad and Allah. Wow, <clears throat> that's I know I'm saying things that are very probably unfamiliar to you and to to most people. Yeah, I mean, I I think I think it's we've heard of these things. Like for me, I've heard of these things, but then I've heard it be debunked, right? And then I'm like, okay, well, then I'm back in the state of like kind of not knowing, and then. Um, you know, someone might come in with a good resource and then they, they, they come in and be like, no, nah, like, don't get it twisted. This is how it is. This is what's written down. Um, because again, if you're allowed to lie, what can you believe? I mean, I, I, I try to navigate the world with having relative, uh, confident in people not gonna, they're not going to publicly say something that is a blatant lie. Um, I always kind of listen with a grain of salt, but um, you got to understand, you know, what, what, what frame or hardware are they coming from? Like, what's their operating system? Is there, is their operating system giving them a particular license to lie? If that's yes, then that's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, with jihad, the caliph fights all other peoples until they become Muslim. But if there is no caliph, then that responsibility falls upon the individual Muslim. Or well, that responsibility falls upon the most senior Muslim, the imam. That's why the imams are often responsible for calling jihad and for having weapons stored in their mosques in the basement. So the caliph fights all peoples until they become Muslim. Okay. Wow. Um, and also notice it says here, Jesus will rule by the law of Muhammad. So Jesus is actually a Muslim and he will follow the Sharia behind Muhammad. Jesus will be a wow. follower of Muhammad. And this does not contradict the final coming of Jesus since Jesus will not rule according to the Evangel, the New Testament but as a follower of our prophet that is taught in the Sharia. Jesus and to be honest, that doesn't surprise yeah. me because the thing is like, you, you got it. Like some, sometimes people's words 
and and their actions don't line up. Like for example, right? Like they say, oh, okay, well, you know, Jesus is still, you know, the biggest prophet. He's the biggest um, name in in our religion in, in Islam, but. I don't really hear one people being named Jesus as much as Muhammad. I don't hear people talking about um, Jesus as much as they talk about Muhammad. There's just there's just certain there's things no. that you just don't see uh, things that are like lined up to where it's like, nah, like I think Muhammad's your 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 main guy. Like you 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 can think no, that Jesus. Yeah, like it it just it doesn't really add up from from actions, right? They can say it. But just actions, it seems like this is this yeah. this ain't your side. This ain't your uh, your mistress. This is your your main. If if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So there's another Sharia manual which goes into much more detail. The reliance is like a compendium. It has a little bit of everything. So there's, and people will say no. It's only a state of war. No, Islam is permanently at war until all the world becomes Muslim. So this war wow. is the war against unbelief, right? So the war continues until they become Muslim. So this is very clear and fight those who do not believe in Allah. They explain these verses. So the Caliph makes war. Now remember, if there's no Caliph, this falls upon Muslims. There must always be a group of Muslims fighting in the, in the condition of Azima, right? So the Caliph makes war upon Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians. That's the objectives of Jihad. Okay. Wow. And now, notice here, for instance, I'll show you an example of the contradiction. Whatever you see in the Sharia, you can find a contradiction. Whatever is in the Quran, something that says peace, you can find the exact opposite. That's, that's just constant in Islam. It is offensive to conduct a military expedition against hostile non-Muslims without the Caliph's permission. So don't do it, you bad Muslims. Although if there's no Caliph, then no permission is required. So just go ahead and do it. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. You understand? You will find this everywhere within the Sharia. So we need to go to the the, the formal definition, okay? So the formal and I think, definition I think of for, Jihad. for people for people that like are listening, maybe they are haven't really been raised in a religious um, household or don't aren't really familiar with scripture. Like, even if like this is like this doesn't even sound like anything in the ballpark of any other religion. Like this is stuff that's like. If you would read this and you grew up, maybe you didn't even know you didn't know the Bible by heart, but you would know like this stuff is not in the Bible. Like you know for a fact just because it's in it's just inconsistent. No, with, that's uh, because the, the Bible was corrupted by the Jews. You see, the Jews rewrote the Bible and they took out all of the stuff, and then Muhammad came along in the seventh century and brought the Bible back. He had the original in Jeel, you see, except he lost it and they don't have a copy right now. But the Bible's definitely been edited. They just don't have an original copy. They, they lost their copies too. Really unfortunate. But hey, we just happened to have the Quran for you. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, you're, it's, you're most it's, it's crazy. It's it's crazy. Like it's, I mean, 500 years. I mean, for those who don't know, I mean, five 500 years, 600 years after Jesus died, Muhammad yep. lived. Is that correct? Six, yeah, 630s he died. So apparently born 570, died 632 supposedly. But he has the real, that real word. Yeah. So notice it is kufr, right? It is blasphemy. And kufr is a capital punishment crime. To deny that Allah intended the prophet's message. That, okay, to deny that Allah wanted Islam to be the religion <laughs> followed by the entire world. It is kufr, okay? To, to admit any kind of ecumenicism. Now, jihad means to war against non-Muslims. And it's derived from the word mujahada, signifying warfare to establish the religion. That is the legal definition. Now, a better resource than this one, which goes into far more detail, has like 120 pages on the topic, would be the um, hedaya. Okay. But um, now they say here the scriptural basis for jihad prior to scholarly consensus are the Quranic verses. Fighting is prescribed for you. Quran 2, 216. Slay them wherever you find them and fight the idolaters utterly. Verses 936 and 489. Now, Muslims will 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 argue high and low, but the Sharia, the, the problem is the Sharia is black and white, very clear. No ambiguity. The Sharia says these verses mean this. Wow. Yeah, I, I would say maybe as a pushback, like this is the common thing that people talk about. They're like, oh, well, you know, in Deuteronomy, in um, maybe the end of Exodus, um, maybe not Exodus, but, um, mainly Deuteronomy, I would say they talk about how, you know, there's just, 
atrocities in the in the Old Testament. They say, oh, okay, the book of the book of Deuteroscopy is historical, right? So there's a difference between describing a history and providing a command that is valid for all time, binding upon all people in all places. Deuteronomy is not binding for all people upon in all places. That is a story. It's a history. It's a discussion. Right. Whereas what is in the Quran is supposedly the perfect actions by the perfect man following the perfect law of the perfect Allah. And this is valid for all time upon all men. Right. So there's a there's a very great difference. There, there are multiple minor and major covenants in the Bible and the Old Testament, according to Christian belief, was taken over by the New Testament, fulfilled in Jesus. And then you have a New Testament. So some of the laws if you look at if you look at 2 peter i believe it is where they say that there was the whole discussion with the judaizers and you had the very first council of jerusalem where it was decided that the 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 gentiles in syria in antioch sorry in antioch were not required to follow the mosaic law in full so the aspects of the mosaic law that were decided at the very first council of jerusalem by the apostles was for instance to abstain from fornication from drinking blood of living animals and strangling and eating those things. And there was no need to perform circumcision. So there are certain of these laws that are still binding, but the rest are not. So the, Islam has a very different exegesis than does the Bible. We, there, there is no book of Acts, right? There's a book of Acts, right? Whereas Islam teaches explicitly, remember, it's a legal system. Let me go here. Let me just show you this. For instance, Islam calls itself a deen. What is a deen? According to its own definitions, it's a socio-political system, right? It's a political framework for managing mankind's affairs. And within the linguistic meaning, we have to go to two major sources. The two most famous Arabic dictionaries are the Al-Qamus Al-Muhit and the Lisan Al-Arab. And each one has like 20 volumes, right? And they both state there are four meanings of the word deen. The first one is subjugation and dominance which entails ownership, government, administrative or legislative authority. Do you see any mention of religion in there or spirituality? Because I'm missing it. Obedience and bondage, meaning subordination, dominance under the power of others. See anything spiritual in that? Then rules, regulations, doctrine, ideology, tradition, or, or religion. See? Now, if you look at it this way, so the first meaning, according to the Muslim, these Muslim dictionaries, the first meaning is subjugation or dominance, administrative or legislative authority to put pressure to be obedient or using power to enslave or make one obedient, right? I subjugated them, so they obeyed me. And this also means I ruled or governed upon him. Thus, the word dayan is used to indicate a person who dominates and rules over a state, a nation, or a tribe. That, that's the Muslim definition there. So the second meaning is obedience and bondage, subordination and domination by someone and bearing humiliation under subjugation and power of the Muslims. So here, al din does not mean religion. It means obedience and obedience under the subjugation and domination of the Muslims. Now, if you look at it like this on a chart, now there's different ways of rearranging this, right? But there's, they give you 12 different categories of the meaning of the word deen, and religion is optional, and it is 10th. And we focus here, and we ignore all the rest. Wow. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a different like mentality when you go into each, each text. Like Definitely, the, I guess, psychology or the way it's maybe uh, structured in Islam, is it is more of like, this is what you have to do, this is what you need to do. It is more of, of, of rules when... The Bible is definitely like different types of things. I mean, it's poetry, it's it's rules, it's philosophies, it's advice, yeah. it's harsh rulings. Like even in if you go to the Old Testament, when you talk about those things, um, it's not necessarily saying like, oh, well, it's all like I, I heard the guy in the debate. He was like, oh, well, you know, some some people say it's fables, you know, like some people think it's like fables made for us to learn uh, certain lessons, which maybe some of it, but I don't like 
it, it's written in a very like this is what happened and guess what we need like it even tells stories like of mo of moses you know <laughs> moses talks to talks to uh god and he's like how are, how are they gonna listen to me dude like i can't just like say these things and you know, have them listen to me. Like, I don't even, I can't, I have a speech impediment. Like I can't even speak. Like, I don't want to be blasphemous and like, and paraphrase, but he was like, you know, throw your, throw your staff on the ground. It'll turn into a snake and then they'll know like who they're dealing with. So like showing proof of things was always an important thing, even in the first mm -hmm. book of the Bible. So like saying it's like just, oh, fables, whatever. But again, context matters. Like it's not written in the sense of like what we think of today. Like these old, these people in the Old Testament, you know, they had, you know, they're set apart people. They were going to be the first, you know, Israelites. So there was going to be some harsh rules, right? There, they were. God really revealed Himself um, to them in different ways to show, like, hey, you need to kind of get on my program, or else, you know, we we we, <laughs> we got to figure out what's going on. Right. You spoke of what the Muslims were saying. So understand Dawa. If we go to the now, this is the Encyclopedia of Islam which I use regularly. This is the gold standard, the gold academic standard. And when you look at the authors, I mean, you're going to see this has been written for, this is running for over a century now, this, this particular work. It comprises, uh, there's at least 13 volumes or more. It's updated on a quarterly basis, I believe. And it costs about 36,000 euros to buy a copy, um, about 40, $42,000 to buy a copy of it. And you can rent it for like $5,000 a year if you'd like. If you want to save a little bit of money. So this is not just written by Orientalists who hate Islam. This is written by, this is the gold standard in Islamic academic knowledge. All right. This is extremely detailed. It's, I mean, like I said, it's, it's, it's huge. Now, Dawah, notice it can mean call and it can mean invitation to Islam. They don't have to be truthful to you. They just, but they just have to bring you into Islam. But notice propaganda. See, Dawah also means propaganda. It also means pretension. Now, everyone's going to go, well, you know, Lord, the word according to the Western dictionary means blah, 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 blah. The fact is the Muslims aren't using your dictionary, so really I don't care. So this means to pretend, to lie. See, so Dawah is propaganda. Now, notice here, under the Abbasid dynasty, Dawah was, strictly speaking, propaganda for a member of the Prophet's family mm -hmm. and propaganda for the Imam who alone could give mankind good guidance. So in the ninth century, when there were these conflicts, these, these, these theological conflicts, the Abbasid dynasty paid rhetoricians, they paid sophists, propagandists to write counter arguments to the arguments that they were facing from the Christians and others and within splits within their own ranks. So they created a very, very efficient, paid, state-backed, state-run propaganda machine to write dawa, to write government propaganda to promote Islam, to promote a particular view of Islam. So dawa is propaganda. It says, strictly speaking, propaganda. So understand, you're not looking at, when you say evangelization, that does not have the connotation of to lie. It doesn't have the connotation of political overtones. Whereas dawa is government propaganda. Wow. Yeah, I guess... Uh I always think of, you know, that one, you know, Muslim kid and, you know, what do they know that they're a part of, you know, what, like how, I mean, for me, even as, as someone who, um, you know, is a follower of Jesus, you know, you, you gotta, you, you cer take certain things for granted. Not everyone can do their research about every religion, which they probably should, especially if they're going to be part of one. Um, but what do you think? I mean, we've already kind of talked about most, most, uh, Muslims don't really know what they're getting themselves into, but what do you think is kind of your prediction of how things will move forward? Like, what do you think will happen? Um, look big question. That's, I'm that's just a, literally thinking out loud. I that's know that's a, tough a big one, question. <laughs> for instance, the Muslim Brotherhood has a plan by 2028 to destroy America and to make itself politically powerful, right? They, they've got a hundred, they have a hundred year plan and it would seem they've been very, very successful so far with their plan. Al Qaeda had a plan which was supposed to be finalized, I think, by 2021, uh, which was put back slightly. But um, it's, it still seems to be, I mean, they're pushing very hard politically. They're using their oil money. 
to infiltrate into governance to um, like in the UN, along with the, I mean, the Chinese are very much in control of the UN, but also the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Conference. They have very powerful influence in the UN because they operate as a group. Now, sure, they have their divisions and they are competing, but also they operate as a group. So they are using this influence. If you look at their, their influence in American universities, for instance, they spend billions subverting American universities and changing people's minds by through the educational institutions. So this is something. On the other hand, the internet, now that we have all of these resources and we've got software that can index and go through thousands of references and bring up keywords and help us to, to dissect Islam. And now that I'm, I'm able to, which I'm able to do because I have specialized software, which I can use to search through thousands of references to index them and, and, and key and find things to, you know, and, and find information that it wasn't possible just one or two, three years ago, right? Um, Islam is starting to see, I would say it's starting to, it's starting to be examined the way that Christianity was attacked and examined in the 1800s. And it's not faring well. It's the, the fact that it is Gnostic, the fact that there are some very strong pagan roots to Islam. Right, the Babylonian moon religion, the fact that, that you can find all of these sources and references within the Islamic sources, if you just look the things that Muslims weren't telling you, Islam, I think, is crumbling. And so I think it is, on the one hand, weakening. So it's, it's just a matter of, you know, they, they're going to do damage, I think, and they are, if you look in Europe, with the, with the boat invasion, right, the boat people. But on the other hand, Islam is crumbling. Um, however, they also are undermining Christianity, and we need to bring back those beliefs so that people can establish their own tradition and their own culture in the face mm. of this, the social assault. So those are my thoughts. Mm. Interesting. No, thank you for sharing. That's really interesting. That makes a lot of sense. I would say, you know, a lot of people are asked, like I, I'm definitely like in that boat, like I'm asking certain questions that I don't know why I never asked in the beginning. Like for like even randomly, like this girl was posting something with a Moroccan flag um, in the background. And I was like, I was like, what? I was like, I thought I was, sometimes I turn my phone into black and white just to like not have it be so addicting. And it was like a TikTok. And I was like, why do you have like a, why do you have like a satanic like star in your, in the background of your, uh, cause I didn't, it, it was no color. So all I saw was like a, a star symbol that's like very, very like blatantly obvious. Like everybody knows. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so I saw that I was like, why are you like so demonic? Like I was kind of giving her crap. I was like, why are you so dark? Like, why do you have like, I know you're trying to be edgy. Like some people like think it's like edgy or like cool to be like kind of dark. So I was like, she's like, no, it's a Moroccan flag. And I was like, why yeah. does a Moroccan flag have a, have a, and like, it kind of yeah. like, and then you This talk, is the yeah. pentagram. We would, we would call that the satanic pentagram. It's though it's right way up rather than upside down, but that's all the same. So the pentagram is Babylonian, right? It is pagan. It is the symbol for the gods Ishtar and Marduk. And the red here from the flag is from the Imams of Yemen. Yemen was, Yemen was traditionally a, a state where they followed the religion of the moon god Shin, who was the Babylonian moon god, right? They called him a different name. They called him Makkah. You may have heard of a place in Saudi called that, but but so they had the god, yeah, Makkah. Sound familiar? Never, never heard yeah, of it myself. It kind of does. It kind of does. <laughs> yeah. So so in Yemen they had the god what they called Al Makkah, and Al Makkah had many many names. He was also the Allah of the Kaaba, right? So. So you've got the pentagram is the seal of Solomon, and these, that's the, the claim that they make, but it is the pentagram. I mean, this is, this is considered occultic and satanic in, in a Western Christian context. And the moon is, I mean, you've got Morocco here, and then you've got the moon or the stars are common across, I mean, it's right on top of the mosque. Moon and star. Yeah, and he goes into depth about this stuff, guys. Like, it's so interesting, and it kind of does give a little bit of more of like context to certain things we just think are, oh, you know, it's just, that's just what it is. And, you know, there's no history in it. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I think that, I don't think people do things on accident. It's very, it's very rare. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a, this is a lengthy series, like five or six episodes. And I go into great detail historically on this. And again, I provide all my sources. I, I don't hide my sources that my references are there for anyone to download and check for themselves. Um, so I provide all of this stuff for people to check. Yeah, it all, it kind of just, it just connects dots. Like it just, it simply just connects, connects dots that you, 
you want to connect. And, and I think people, a lot of people think certain things were so long ago that there isn't really anything there, any writing, any archaeology to really look back at. So they kind of stopped searching past like maybe a thousand, two thousand years back. And you start to realize like, even if you go back there, there's a lot of stuff that you miss that can kind of reinforce information yeah. that you already have. Look, to people don't realize sense. when you read the, the Sira, the Gospels of Muhammad, the Muslims very bluntly state they reject Judaism, they reject Christianity, Islam is, is an, they make the claim that Islam is an Abrahamic religion because Abraham was a Muslim, not a Jew, not the first Jew. Mm -hmm. Abraham was a Muslim and of course we know within, within, the, within the, the standard orthodox view of, of Abraham, his father was a worshipper of the moon god, his whole family, they are named after the moon god. They, 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 his family, his uncles, his brothers are all named after various incarnations of the same moon god. There are different aspects of the moon god, right? His father, Terah, is just another name for Shin, another name for Al-Makkah, the same god, the wow. same moon god of Babylon. Abraham himself worshipped the Babylonian moon god. And Islam states bluntly, it follows the religion of Abraham, but they don't, they forget to tell you the religion of Abraham before he turned to Yahweh. Because wow. that apparently is a false story spread by the Jews. So Islam follows the religion of Abraham before he turned to Yahweh. And he was a moon worshiper of the God of Babylon, the God Whoa. Shin. Does Whoa. that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. No, that that is crazy. Yeah. I mean, I've done a little bit of the research and like even just through watching you, it's just been like, super interesting and you're very you know you, you're very thorough you always provide you know you're very skeptical yourself which is very uh refreshing because a lot of people will just say things and not provide any resources or not really come back with anything um so it's refreshing to have somebody that provides resources well, look i mean i show my sources on the screen i'm reading it off the page this is not my opinion i'm showing people look i'm saying what the words in the book are saying and here i'm showing these are these are the muslims own books written by the top scholars Right. I'm, I'm not making it up. I'm providing these resources for people. And I've, I've offered to Muslims, let's have a public conversation about this. And they refuse because they realize this is damaging to Islam. Well, I think even, I mean, we, we don't even really need to pick, pick on Islam necessarily. I mean, even scholars that are part of universities, there's certain information they don't want to talk about. They don't want to get into because it's disparaging to their institution, disparaging to they this. They also don't want to get stabbed in the religion. parking lot to lose their funding from Saudi Arabia. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, it's true. It's just, it's just true. So I think independent, I mean, independent media, independent people that have no attachments, no connections. I think that they're going to be the only people that you can really, you know, rely on in the sense. So I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you for coming on. Like for real guys, don't forget to like subscribe uh, to his channel. Also, if you're not subscribed to mine, you know, you know, please like subscribe. Um, he, does a lot of deep dives, a lot of stuff that is going to be, if you're a nerd like me, I mean, I feel like if you're watching and listening to this podcast, you're going to, if you, and if you're listening this far, you probably are the type of person that are going to be super interested in the stuff that he covers. Um, he not only covers it by himself, but also has, has people on that make it really interesting. So, um, thank you for coming on. Any final words, anything you want to, any way you want to like kind of wrap it, wrap it up, put a bow on uh, it? No, I, no, not much. I, I was surprised. We, we really dove into this at some depth. I mean, the questions, you know, it was a really good flow. Um, yeah, we had discussed before the show that we might dive into things like Protestant history and so on, but which we didn't touch on. So, so really this, this seemed to, but yeah, this was, this was great. Um, I do also go in, in, in depth into, uh, the history of atheism and mm, socialism and good. also darwinism darwinism is based quite bluntly on paganism pagan greek pagan ideas um uh atheism is is oddly enough is traced to paganism too which is which is insane and the the, the modern history of of atheism is steeped in occultism um, and also i mean just the, the insanity as a political movement looking at the French Revolution and its connection to genocide and atrocity. It's, so these are subjects that I go into these very difficult subjects. I provide extremely detailed talks with my resources, with my citations, with the books available to download, check for yourself. So yeah, um, these are, I don't just talk about Islam. I, I discuss multiple different topics. 
And yeah, atheism at some point, might be like, my favorite other than this, like atheism, other than the Islam, like atheism, like how you dive into that, because it does affirm things that I've been thinking about, especially being here. You know, it's like you, you, you hear people say they're atheists, but they talk about manifestation, chakras, uh, you know, uh, crystals. Um, you know, I'm like, dude, like, do you know what you're doing? Like, is, is this like, you think it's like something that has no connection to anything you're just, yeah, it's just, it's really interesting. Yeah. No. And yeah. So lately I've been doing a talk on Darwin. I just covered Hitler and uh, Hitler's beliefs, Hitler's religion, and whether the claims that, that Hitler was, was very much in bed with the Catholic church. I went into that in depth. I can confirm Hitler was very much in bed with the Protestant church. He mm -hmm. was, yeah, yeah. There, there were, there were serious, uh, there were, there were bed buddies. Hitler and Protestant theologians, very, very close, joined at the hip. Um, and yeah, so there's the claims that Hitler was a Christian, the claim that Marx was Christian, Stalin, all of these things. I go into depth on all of these these questions. And um, right now I'm just doing a talk on John Calvin and Calvin's beliefs, which and Martin Luther as well. I've covered that and people have been very upset with my expose on Martin Luther. So yeah, it's um, bluntly speaking, they were Gnostics. So wow. they were doing their, their, their own flavor of Gnosticism. And yeah, so it's that they created their own version of Gnosticianity. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. I mean, I say very blunt <laughs> things, but I, I do provide very detailed um, citation, well, talks, presentations with citations, with the references. And I don't just use any old funny daddy references. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Cool. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching. Peace.